This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Rosia Shy here uh, with another episode of Musings of the Shy podcast. And on this episode, we are going to discuss all the other types of solutions that have been proposed. They're not the main ones like uh, Bitcoin XT, which kind of kicked off the kind of schism that we're having a bit of with the block size debate within the Bitcoin community. Uh, Bitcoin Classic, Bitcoin Unlimited. SegWit, which has two different versions uh, going on out there. Uh, so these are different proposals that people have put forth towards the community as a solution to the block size debate. We'll also touch on the description, or I should say, uh, the understanding of the terms of some add-ons you might hear people talk about when discussing the block size debate, but they're not actually solutions to uh, either raising or lowering or uh, addressing the issue of with the configuration of, of, of the block size. These are the things that could happen after some, um, some solutions have occurred, and one of them is light and light. So we're just going to touch on that. We'll go in depth about add-ons and different uh, configurations and different uh, properties people have wanted to add on into the uh, Bitcoin protocol, but end up going into their uh, different cryptocurrencies or uh, adding on some additional cryptocurrencies. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that. Uh, later on down the road, and it's not necessarily um, essential to the block understanding those if you simply understand the block size debate. Uh, these are just things that are uh, just going um, as part of the, the Bitcoin community about scheme and the direction that Bitcoin can go towards, or cryptocurrency in general can go towards. Uh, but this is episode 135 All the Girls, um, the ones that you don't know about. But before we so this article is by Joseph Young. It comes from Coin Telegraph. Man borrows three hundred twenty-five thousand to buy Bitcoin. Investment or gamble on savings. I'm not gonna read the entire article, but if this is something that uh, a lot of people have done very early on and continue to do so, where they borrow um, money for the sole purpose of, you know, investment, and in this case, it's uh, for cryptocurrency. So online community user going by the online alias Ginger. Red Fudders, who has an undisclosed term on this page, recently purchased 325000 worth of Bitcoin as a digital currency, she did it at an all-time high of $1,700. Uh, so this article is done back in May. So Bitcoin price has decreased significantly since the reaching of uh, 1800 at a global average across major markets on May 11th. However, the users in the online community were uh, gingerbread foolish names and also partially criticized this decision to all in on Bitcoin after they discovered they need to pay the capital for the loan. To be specific, specific Ginger Brothers required an equity loan on his house in order to purchase 190 Bitcoin. He stated, I decided to make my newest uh, loan using what equity I have occurred on the state over the past 10 years since the 2008 financial crisis. If Bitcoin reaches the 10K mark, which I see as a distinct possibility, I would not have taken such a risk. I plan on moving to the West Coast and getting away from all the angry people here where I currently so, this is something that people are doing. It kind of goes a little bit further, but uh, it could be a big payoff or it could be a, a complete disaster. But that's a decision that that is a decision you have to suffer the consequences for. But just uh, in general, I think it's something that people should be aware of as something that you know either they consider or not consider. They should probably consult some kind of financial consultant. I myself is not a financial consultant, but I just want people to make aware that this is the actions that people are taking. This is not money that's being put into the cryptocurrency space at, at this time. Currently, that person did all the Bitcoin, but a lot of people are spreading it out across uh, various altcoins. This article comes from Wikipedia, we have a problem dot com. Uh, this is written by, this is State for Millions. Uh, David Gear versus the blockchain, a peek into the version of the war. It's published June 11th. Uh, billionaire Ascension and the Blockchain. This year, the former CEO and founder of Mozilla and JavaScript creator Brennan Elch raised $35 million in 30 seconds from his back coin, or basic attention currency. Uh, eventually, we'll touch on ICOs and which ones have utility and which ones don't. Uh, that's something that's going to be further down the line. I didn't anticipate when starting out discussing the uh, block size debate. Um, all the various components that go into it, and the ever-shifting and changing nature of, of a decentralized system that's um, 
cause me to add uh, additional information, but uh, eventually we're going to catch up on a lot of uh, the activity that's been going on in the space. Uh, this is an altcoin that was created on the blockchain and turned into cold cash in less than a minute. Britain hopes that the Batcoin will solve many of the problems around the global digital advertising nightmare, where users can actually make money when they opt into viewing ads. It is a high-level solution architecturally to get people excited about the currency that, we drive, that will drive it all. Finance and tech, tech entrepreneurs are eager to jump in and explore this dynamic new marketplace of ICOs for initial coin offering. One of the fun things about cryptocurrency is ICO, finance, tech, and all things blockchain as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur I said, not a wild west cowboy, is a space cowboy, is the Mars exploration off finance. The potential of the upside is something coin enthusiasts rave, rave about, often reaches utopian levels of excitement. Uh, billionaire assertions for all. What type of enthusiasm? There is a bound to be both extreme criticism as well as lots of misinformation, right? I uh, trusted and credible, reliable information. I find cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, offline, Ethereum, and innovation in the blockchain smart contract absolutely fascinating. Recently in my other life as a platform developer, I've been talking with a few finance tech companies, hoping to meet the world I'm previously unfamiliar with. I found myself in a position where I need to understand more about the blockchain fast. A topic like this is going to be getting lots of searches for people like me, and Wikipedia is likely to be one of the first stops for anyone interested in learning more about cryptocurrency. I've recently I have every reason in the world to be highly suspicious for a candle from Wikipedia. Wikipedia articles on cryptocurrency and blockchain are guarded by the skeptic activists on Wikipedia, especially Grand Wizard skeptic David Geer, who is also part of the Rational Media Brain Trust. The website features sizzling near primary for his abuse in targeting individuals and misinformation campaigns and attacking their reputation on the internet. Agnostic of the crypt- cryptocurrency want like an agenda influence on influence or ideological editor. Control the narrative of the blockchain or Wikipedia and the blockchain community. This is exactly where Wikipedia finds itself vulnerable to Wiki War. David Geer in real life certainly has an agenda when it comes to the blockchain. He's not a fan. Uh, David Geer has been an agnostic and perhaps even Luddite of cryptocurrency for over a few years. Not just interested in valid criticism of blockchain technology, but adding a snark, insult, and verbal abuse to those who disagree with him in the extreme viewpoint of finance tech. Uh, Geer Gerard is a virtual and outspoken critic who hypes the blockchain smart contracts who up as nothing more than a Ponzi scheme or pump and dumps, only good for criminals. He has even written a book about the blockchain, warning the world that it's literally all of this terrible garbage you should go for a while. Um, a rational week, week and for years has supported this message. Uh, and then there's an embedded post. You know, you all should know that David Gear has been pushing the post about the trash Ethereum thing, which I think is media. Um, it's posted by, uh, on our it's created by uh, Mr. Underscore Yonka Underscore C. Uh, the Ethereum community is concerned, and it should be. And this is the man, the man who controls the narrative of Wikipedia's Ethereum article, as well as running agnostic persuasion campaigns in Rational Wika. Uh, David Geary has been criticized for this type of behavior, even from his own peers. He's also, he has also lost privilege with Wikimedia and Wikipedia himself, red flag when he uses private information. Yet, when faced with criticism of his behavior, David's response tends to be, Attack someone's character, similar to the Trumptonian political persuasion. And where possible, David will then begin to edit the Wikipedia articles of those who disparage, which he also does with the less wrong article on Wikipedia, for example. Uh, David Gear is a political activist and views the cryptocurrency through the lens of a political dialect as a libertarian agenda, completely unable to distinguish between uh, innovation and finance technology and media with his own ideological, a liberal versus libertarian worldview. Um, the liberal versus libertarian political discussion has been extreme. Rational media is to the left of the political spectrum, as Judge you day to what 4chan um, whole slash whole alt right is to the right of the political spectrum. I don't know if that's a fair comparison there, but right. Don't let the ide- uh, ideologies fool you. Both are allowed ab- abusive, toxic, misinformed, and aggregated communities who weaponize digital media to promote their agendas. Okay, you're a bit of a bias there. If you think I'm going on in this forum and I go into place myself, the media threats, both groups are highly problematic online. Uh, David Gear, like many skeptic activists I have encountered on Wikipedia, comes off to others as an abusive and abrasive individual online. His skill set lay in being able to navigate in and, and dominate toxic communities online through creating competition to see which user can snark the other for dominance. Snark has no place in establishing rational or collaborative. Consensus building using consensus building is weaponized, used for shaming those with opposing viewpoints, often using user language to listen to participation of the person altogether. So, kind of skipping around here. So, 
one of the core problems with the Wikipedia editors like David Gear are not as ideological as much as the psychological behavior. If you have the pleasure of having to attempt to build a consensus with a crowd like I have, you quickly find that at the core at all their arguments tend not to be source logical and question as much as snark. I give them to remove the snark from the argumentation, usually the arguments collapse like a house of cards, but they don't, because often they're going to dominate an online consensus around any subject of the internet. I'm fine with ha- having that a one voice in consensus, however, the other problem is the collective of editors use the to dominate, not collaborate. They practice edit suppression on Wikipedia, and they do this by attacking the reputations of other ed- editors, sometimes going to extreme tense, as in the case of yours truly. Often, then, the valid criticism is will attack your personal reputation, which is a rational do- dossier. How it starts. The cryptocurrency community will naturally find that, that Wikipedia articles are guarded by critics on the block chain is serious issue. Some members of the community will initially attempt to balance their articles related to cryptocurrency. The skeptic activists on Wikipedia will do what they do in other v- verticals. They will get these blockchain editors sanctioned, banned, or removed from those articles. Next, those individuals sanctioned from Wikipedia will either attempt to gain Wikipedia return or go off to create their own Wikipedia and run their course on Wikimedia software and continue the information down, down spirals as so many other niche communities who get involved in Wikipedia wars. Who gets to control the narrative of the blockchain of Wikipedia? Should it be disinterested, disinterested editors? Yes. Is it? No. On Wikipedia, in many cases, it's the critics or the proponents of the subject that can control the narrative and context of the article. You either get one side of the argument or the other. So, this is all about just, uh, oh, and this is article is written, written by Ramon Zero. This article is just um, kind of breaking down how information is key, especially as uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology cryptocurrencies out there are gaining momentum and significant momentum because, because either price or utility that having the proper information out there is essential. It's very essential to have correct information. And if it's not delineated in a, a irrational manner or a very objective manner, you're going to get a lot of misinformation, a lot, lot, a lot of wrong information, a lot of bad feelings as people um, enter this space and they don't have the correct foundation to make the most appropriate or best decisions for themselves. That's my best summation of that article. So a little bit of Dogecoin news, and we'll do a, a mega update on Dogecoin. I think that might be the best palette cleanser after the you know, uh, Bitcoin Forum Science debate discussion. As we touched on um, a few episodes back, uh, there was an incident caretaker of the Dogecoin tin bot is basically absconded with all the Dogecoins in the bots, um, either through a period of time or just all at once. It's not really clear. Uh, if you go to the R Dogecoin subreddit, there is um, a sticky thread that breaks it all down. But uh, users have since um, developed and um, decided to create their own bot, one in which individuals control their private and um, public keys. And it's a big difference between with, with this dot and the Doge uh, bot, tip bot, it wasn't necessarily on the blockchain, it was like in a database type of system. And we'll go on the breakdown about that. Um, the full disclosure, I did have some Dogecoin in that uh, tip bot, but, you know, like uh, all things that happen in this game, you know, that the money is basically gone or the coin is gone. But, uh, so there is a new bot, it's so Doge tip bot. Um, they have fixed some issues, uh, they have a list of Complete changes available. They have 248 accounts, 460 Doge or donations to the so, uh, so Doge tip bot. Um, don't hesitate. They have a Reddit post for the bot. They offer uh, their next features they're going to offer are multi suit for all, uh, vanity gym, custom addresses, warning messages to hide balances or device to draw on a paper wallet. And I think this is a good thing. This is one of the things about you know Dogecoin in general is to get knocked down they don't stay down they get back up they learn their lesson and they try to make some um, significant improvements uh we'll see where this happens it's really affected a few communities one of them being our um a millionaire maker which does the monthly um draw if you will that uh you post a comment in the, the mega thread for that month if your name is a uh, draw then people will donate you know, either through PayPal, Bitcoin, Litecoin, and Dogecoin was one of them. And they had a suspend last month because there was, you know, a portion of, of people's previous winners' um, assets in that Doge bot. 
and so and probably the, the millionaires bought as well. So there was an issue with a hiccup, hiccup where they didn't have a draw last month, and we'll see what happens this month in June. Uh, typically, they they have a draw around the twentieth or the twenty second of each month, and you know it's just a little sad. It's a little heartbreaking. I'm sure there'll be some legal consequences for Elon to get into all that, but as of now, um, there is a new Doge bot. You can use with people on the internet but through the Reddit system. And it's called So So Doge Tip, and you can uh, click on the link within um, the article I have linked here on the show notes. And that is it for the news. Now, on discussion. On- so, what are these? Other proposals that people are talking about. Well, one of them is block extensions. Uh, the others are side chains, Lightning Network, Mim- uh, Mumble Wimble, Emerging Consensus, and uh, Bcoin. And so we're going to break down which e- what each of these are, uh, what they have to do with the overall block uh, size debate. And they actually are performing any significant changes. Uh, with Lightning Network and Mumblewimble, we are just going to kind of, because uh, they're more of an add-on, we are going to just, just basically cover their definition and just uh, discuss them at a different time. Uh, side chains, we're going to get into a little bit, a little bit more because it's something that's brought up. It's also an add-on. Um, we'll talk about some examples about what side chains are. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, parity and then... Uh, Primarily that we're going to discuss what is block extensions and what uh, emerging consensus is because this is another proposal that's out there and then we're going to first start off with talking about Bcoin and Bcoin is a JavaScript uh, implementation. It's a very basically is a, co- a cosmetic way of coding uh, Bitcoin because Bitcoin at its core is coded in C++ while Bcoin is JavaScript, more people know JavaScript, and so it's a mechanism for people that have an understanding of JavaScript to work on the Bitcoin protocol. So it's just it's a protocol implication. But it's important to talk about it because it also has a thing to do with a, a block extensions and, and stuff like that. So let's talk about Bcoin, and then we'll just go down through the list here. Okay, so Bcoin comes from the Purse.io company. So the guys that are enabling and allowing people to purchase uh, items off of Amazon with the usage of Bitcoin are responsible for Bcoin. Now, Bcoin in itself is not actually uh, a protocol to change the blockchain. All it is is an implementation, uh, a programming implementation. You might think of it as a, a skin or just another way of coding with the Bitcoin. It's a node, really, and a, a library of protocols that allow you to make uh, changes and uh, manipulate and do things with Bitcoin. Now, why there's a bit of a confusion when talking about Bitcoin, uh, it has to do with extension blocks, which is something that Purse supports. And we'll talk about that when we, we get to that. But I just want to talk, talk a little bit about what Bitcoin is. So we're finally to announce the official, this is from um, Medium, and this came out in February of this year. Beta release of Bitcoin. The development for Bitcoin started almost two years ago, and for many headaches and long sleepless nights, it's ready for mainstream use. Bitcoin's development history is pretty interesting. Uh, Andre Sadapov has said in the best in recent episode, Let's Talk Bitcoin, uh, featuring Bitcoin's main developer, Christian J.T. J.J. Uh, Jeffrey. Uh, Bitcoin sounds like a case of a monumental scope creep with a happy ending. Uh, after endless increases in project scope and narrowing down exactly what was needed for a scalable Bitcoin full node implementation, that met our needs for e-commerce at Purse. We're really proud of what has been created. What originally started simply as a simple SPV wallet proof of concept by Node.js wizard, uh, Fedro Entity. So uh, an SPV wallet is basically, it doesn't run the full blockchain. It just runs a, a, the most recent implementation. So it allows for a faster download and transactions to go out a little bit quicker, if you will. And we'll get into SPVs um, when we talk about nodes and decentralization uh, with that episode. And now growing into a full-fledged alternative to current reference implementation currently maintained by Bitcoin Core. Built in Node.js, Bitcoin can be implemented almost anywhere and is great for hacking together ideas and experimenting with new concepts. So what is in the blocks? The Bitcoin full node implementation can do anything a normal Bitcoin library can do and so much more. The code base is very modular and loosely coupled along for a plethora of various configurations depending on your Bitcoin development needs. 
So it's a, li- it's a library node that allows you to do um, coding and, and work on the Bitcoin protocol um, to fit your needs, if you will. So Bitcoin natively supports all the latest BIPs and proposed improvements to the Bitcoin protocol, like SegWit. It also includes the first REST API, as well as the latest legacy uh, Johnson RPC and API that exists in the Bitcoin uh, IND. So it has APIs, it has SegWit. Recent improvements for V, the first version, beta, thoroughly tested mined back in, uh, Bitcoin is ready for mining. Uh, Tor and Sox proxy support, so that's very good. It allows you to connect through the node that allows you to connect blockchain validation, blockchain database, mempool slash miner. Uh, so it allows you, the node allows you to mine at the same time. And again, we'll break down that when we talk about nodes. Wallet system and wallet database, so you can have HD keys with BIP44 duplication, Tor support for outbound connections and DNS resolutions. So, another way how flexible is a lot of these different bits. Something that those script, uh, most JavaScript plus, you should do some work and work by and work uh, with Bitcoin. So, this is where the confusion with Bitcoin and block extensions happens. And I'm going to read this from Purse and then we'll talk about what extensions are. So this is from Andrew Lee. It was posted April 6th. Extension block story. Uh, we got caught up in a shirt storm and here's the story. People in the community think Bitcoin marketplace when they hear about Purse. Our mission was to make Bitcoin useful. Like most of you, we love Bitcoin. We get paid to BTC and we pay each other for lunch in BTC and spend way too much time reading Reddit and we have most of our savings in BTC too. We focus on proving our product, listen to our customers, and celebrate project milestones. We took minimum risk pass when it came to choosing a stance on the block size debate for three years. Neutral. If anything, we were poor core and implemented SegWit. A few months ago, we launched Bitcoin and migrated Purse's wallet infrastructure to it. It gave us the flexibility to do cool Bitcoin stuff on Purse. The last 30 days. Uh, last month, we started to get really concerned about the future of Bitcoin. The quality of scaling proposals were deteriorating. We approached it like any other problem. We started talking to users, exchanges, miners, and developers. We talked to representatives from 21, Bitcoin.com, BitPay, BitMain, BoxTrain, BTC, BTCD, Coinbase, GCG, Ledger, Lightning, Kraken, etc. We talked to both sides to get the full picture, and I'll be blunt here. No one had great things to say about core social relations. We started with a list of requirements that would make everyone happy. SegWit, soft fork, and bigger blocks. I got the two of the smartest individuals I knew who shared the common concern, and we made sure that they had plenty of coffee and tea and food. I thought maybe if we sat in a room long enough, they would come up with a solution. After a day, they concluded ex- extension blocks was the only viable option. I asked them how long would it take, at least six months to specify the code. They responded, damn, I thought to myself, thinking there wasn't enough time. Three weeks ago, we faced the interval and started preparing for how we handle customer funds in case of a hard fork. But JVA refused to give up. He wrote a draft spec for extension blocks in one day and working code in another. Amazed, I called up Joseph and said, um, JJ did it. He was working code. Two weeks ago, we started talking to companies to gauge interest, a standard practice in any product development process. We had technical conversations focused on architect, feature, and edge cases. We thought that we had a fair shot since we had talked to companies and users about what they wanted first. The challenge was that too many people, not too many people were familiar with the concept of extension blocks first proposed by Jonas Liu, and we'll read the bit, but the initial feedback was all positive. We were especially encouraged by Stefan's feedback in particular and decided to continue circulating the idea. JJ continued to code. Last Thursday, uh, March 31st, we flew to China to talk to miners. After hearing stories about the Hong Kong agreement, we were worried that they would be wary of ideas from Western developers. We shared the idea and drafted specifications with several mining pools, and they all seemed to like the idea too. This week, after a 12-hour fight back to San Francisco on Monday morning, um, April 3rd, we started thinking about making the idea public. We wanted to make sure it was proposed in a neutral way as possible, so we avoided the standard practices in Bitcoin Core, BIP, and Bitcoin Unlimited, BUIP. The plan was to publish the spec, circulate the announcement in the press, and request community feedback to discuss the technical merits. Then things got weird. Before we had a chance, uh, Samson tweeted saying he, he had we had received 30k from BitMain. It was a blatant lie. We did not receive a dime from BitMain. Uh, Samson was a friend and could easily ask me. We worried that this would paint the idea of bias and we rushed our announcement, specification, and code. They continued, they continued the lies, people I look up to, and even though we were st- friends started propagating the lies, people were believing lies made up by influencers and trolls alike. The most annoying lies are ones that without evidence that can't be disproved. They persist forever. The narrative is playing out perfectly. Evil Chinese miners were funding development. So, 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 some thoughts so far. 
We were all naive. It seemed we stepped on some toes. We thought that's what this community was about, decentralized development where anyone could contribute new ideas. Instead, it's a monopoly spending time, energy, and capital defending it. Regardless, we still believe extension blocks is the best scaling proposal on the table. It's safe, it scales, and gives everyone what they want. Before Core's anger, everyone we talked to liked it. Our goal was not to anger Core. Our goal was to do our small part in helping making Bitcoin greater than it's ever been. So, <clears throat> we will read the uh, extension blocks, and then we'll talk about what extension blocks are. But that's why when you hear Bitcoin, um, and it's related to the block size debate, it's because Purse uh, has put out a proposal about extension blocks out there, and because it kind of coincided with the release of Bitcoin. You know, people get kind of get the two mix. Uh, Purse is responsible for this node implementation, which would no doubt have the updated version, which will allow for um, extension blocks to exist uh, within that node, that type of an update. Uh, there is a bit of confusion. So Bitcoin is actually not a scalar solution. All it is is a, is a node implementation, a different form of it, node implementation using JavaScript instead of C++. And extension blocks is a, a proposal based from this company called Purse to uh, bring forth some kind of solution to um, the scaling debate, to the, the block size debate. So this is from what is embedded in the um, Purse article, and then we're going to read the, the BIP. So auxiliary block increases max block size with software. I first realized that the one megabyte sauce limit would be increased with a soft work. I call it auxiliary block. This came out, um, this is off of a Bitcoin forum, so Bitcoin, Bitcoin.org. Uh, moderators are Maxwell, auxiliary block, increased max size. So this came out in August 29th, 2013. One, auxiliary block is created from each main block. Auxiliary box looks like a traditional block without the header. So uh, it's, it's an OP underscore in, in OP1 is redefined as uh, OP underscore in, underscore uh, AUX. Initially, auxiliary blocks are, are empty until someone sends X Bitcoin to a, to a script public key of this format. So you have to send it directly to that specified type of form of auxiliary block. This will create a Coinbase-like transaction in the auxiliary block with X, X Bitcoin sending to a decentralized script. The Merkle root of the auxiliary block will include the coin base of the main block, and upgrading nodes will check whether the bitcoins were correctly transferred from the main chain to the auxiliary chain. So we're doing, a, we're kind of getting into the whole side chain issue here. People can transfer auxiliary chain bitcoins like the main, like in the main chain. Miners can collect fees in the auxiliary chain using the same mechanism as the main chain. The only difference is there's no generation bonus in the auxiliary chain. No, the new auxiliary coins are generated if and only if someone sends bitcoin. Uh, to that block, to, from that from the main chain to that to that chain. If someone wants to transfer Y auxiliary coins back to the main chain, he will send uh, Y auxiliary coins um, in the proper format uh, out of the auxiliary chain to the proper chain. Seeing this, the miners will randomly choose some um, UTX in the main chain with a value exactly to Y coins and pass them to the decentralized decentralized script in the main chain. Backwards compatibility: since all nodes will not see the auxiliary box, the auxiliary box who would definitely will be definitely big. Uh, two, the OPX outputs look like anyone can redeem, so old nodes can't won't uh, won't uh, complete. Three, if they if someone tries to steal those auxiliary outputs without following the new rules, however, they will be rejected by the majority of the miners, so you can't double spin. Old nodes can still mine as long as they're not trying to include or redeem auxiliary transactions. Their blocks are still valid. More, more extremely, we will disallow people transferring auxiliary coins back to the main chain by requesting them to send Bitcoin to onto the main chain. This will provide better backward compatibility since outputs are not redeemable in both new and old nodes. Old miners will see these as non-standard and wouldn't mind them. So your is allowed for about allowed for old. You wouldn't have to have um, nodes to update to allow for auxiliary box uh, because it's uh, miner protected and the new nodes would be able to handle it and. It has nothing to do with the old nodes, if you will. So here is the BIP. Is BIP extension blocks. What is the BIP number? Hmm. I don't believe this actually has uh, layers consensus soft fork uh, title extension blocks. Let's see. 
Uh, this is from the To the Moon Org. Uh, to the Moon Org is uh, where supporters like Bipe, Yours, uh, Ripo, Ob1, Purse, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, and Bcoin are um, the main site for this proposal for extension blocks. You can, um, I have a link in the show notes. It has the code, the testnet, and the faucet, if you will, and the proposal. And let me see if I can find if there's an actual BIP assigned to. Um, but I'm not seeing it as an official BIP. So here we go. So this is what the extension block is. It's attached to the Tumor to the Moon Org uh, GitHub. I have a link in the show notes. So the layer is considered a soft fork. Titles extension blocks is created by Christopher Jeffrey, Joseph Poon, uh, Fedora Indenti, and Stefan Pear. It was published uh, March 17th. is in draft. The abs- abstract. The specification defines a method of increasing Bitcoin transactions throughput without altering any existing consensus rules. Motivation. Uh, the Bitcoin's network transaction throughput is correlated with its consensus rules and regarding retargeting and denial of service limits. Bitcoin retargeting ensures that the time in between mine blocks will be roughly 10 minutes. It's not possible to change this rule. This has been debated regarding other ways of greatly increasing transactions, uh, throughputs with no proposal. Proposed consensus layer solution has proven themselves to be practically safe. So it's basically saying that it's not changing any type of consensus rules when it comes to this. Uh, history, auxiliary blocks is first proposed by John, Johnson Liu in 2013. Outline a way of having funds enter and exit additional block by using special op codes. Extension block was a later proposal, also from John Liu in 2017, he, which revised many of the ideas of the original proposal. So his the first one was in 2013, which kind of used a kind of a side chain esque type of a deal, and his new proposal came out in January of this year. So specification extension blocks divides a second layer on top of a, the canonical Bitcoin blocks in which a miner will commit the Merkle root of an additional block of transactions. Extension blocks leverage several features of BIP 141, 143, and 144, uh, which deal with SegWit uh, for transactions, opt-in, serialization, verification, network service. This specification should be considered an extension and modification to these BIPs. Extension blocks are not compatible with BIP 141 in its current form and require a few minor additional roles. Extension blocks maintain their own UTX set in order to avoid interference with the existing UTX set in a non-upgraded nodes. This is a tricky endeavor and requiring a resolution transaction to be, to be present at the end of every canonical block. So basically they're saying by doing this method, we're still allowing for old uh, nodes to exist, but we're doing this little this little thing so that way people don't have to upgrade and we're not going to have any softworks or any issues or people are, these things are not going to be compatible. The specification prescribes a way of fooling non-upgraded nodes into believing the existing XDX set is still behaving as they would expect. Unfortunately, this requires a bit of extra bookkeeping on the upgraded node side. So the upgraded nodes are going to do a lot more work than the uh, non-upgraded nodes. An upgraded miner is willing to exclude extension blocks, include an extra coin base output of zero value. The output script exists as such. Uh, the comment serialization and discovery rules follows the same rules defined in BIP 141. The Merkle root is still is said to be calculated as a Merkle tree with an extension and the canonical block text text and W text as they leaves. Any block containing an extension block must include an extension comment output. So for or, for order for something to be considered valid, it has to have this these set of rules implanted in the block. Extension block opt-in. Outputs can signal to enter the extension block by using a witness program script, so using a bit of a BIP 141. Output signal to exit the extension block if they contain a script either minimal encoded uh, by PTPKH KH or PTSH script. Output script codes aside from witness programs, uh, same code, is considered invalid in the extension block. So if you don't do this, if it's not witness it, it's not valid. Uh, resolution transactions are bookkeeping mechanisms which exist to make the total value of the extension blocks uh, UTXO set. They exist as a cons- consecutively redeemed op true output. They handle both entrance into a- and exits from the extension block. So the input and output has to be the same type of key, the same type of method, or it's it's not going to work. Each block containing entry and exiting outputs must contain a final resolution transaction. This resolution transaction sends all outputs they tend to enter the extension block. The resolution transaction must appear as the last transaction in the block in order to properly sweep all the newly created outputs. 
The funds are to be sent in a single, anyone can spend output. The output is forbidden from consensus rules to be spent by any transaction aside from the resolution transaction. The resolution transaction must contain additional outputs for outputs they intend to exit the extension block. Coinbase outputs must not contain a witness program as they cannot be sweeped by the resolution transaction due to previously existing consensus rules. The first input of the resolution transaction must must reference the out, first output of the previous resolution transaction. Fees are to propagate up to the excision block into the resolution transaction. In other words, the resolution transaction fees should be equal to the amount of total fees collected in the excision block. You have to do, utilize this methodology. In order for things to be spent, you have to encode that this is done. The resolution transaction. This is the amount being spent. This is what's being put in the block. This is in the excision block. Everything, the fees, the, the amount being spent, where it's being sent to. All this must be done in its proper order and not to break any type of consensus from the pre you know the the regular block if you will and being sent out. If it's not done then it's it's not gonna go through. In order to bootstrap the activation of extension blocks, a Genesis resolution transaction must be mined in the first block to include an extension block comment along with enter with entering outputs. This is the only resolution transaction in existence that is no prior reference to previous resolution transactions. The Genesis resolution transaction may also include a 1 to 100 bit script in the first input containing a single push only opcode. Op this allows the miners of the Genesis resolution to add a special message. So, this is how miners can indicate that they're accepting or signaling for an extension block. And then it kind of goes into more detail uh, fees. So, this is important because this is how you keep the system going, if you will. Fees collected from inside the extension block propagated to the corresponding resolution transaction. The resolution transaction fee must be equal to the cumulative amount of fees collected inside the extension block. Um, the policy layer transaction fees may be calculated by the transaction cost as well as additional size legacy SIG ops added to the canonical block due to entering and accident or exiting output. So everything must add up for the fees. So if you don't have the proper fee, if it's not adding up, then things are not going to go through. Uh, verification of transactions to the extension block should be enforced are currently deployed by Softwork along with an extra uh, bit 141 like rule sets. So transactions with the standard transaction vector may include the witness vector of bit 141 transaction serialization. So extended transactions must not must not have any access to the canonical UTX set. So everything has to be kind of separated but in the same. You have to follow these very precise rules or th again things are not going to go over. So if you have a regular block propagating throughout the system and it's not an extended block, you can't have extended blocks being able to access these regular blocks because then you're going to have like, you know, double spending issues going on here and vice versa. Uh, it also has a whole section here about adding for um, the Lightning Network, which is an add-on. We'll talk about that. Um, wallet concerns and migrations. Wallet's current supporting BIP141 must be modified in a few key ways in order to achieve compatibility with extension blocks. Wallets must make a chain to spin from which create a transaction, either the you know, the normal chain or the extension block, but not both. In other words, transaction must have all the witness programs input or all the non-witness programs input. For a wallet that supports both chains, the coin selector can automatically pick which chain to use if the user does not specify. Uh, wallet supporting extension blocks must ignore inputs or resolution transaction fees if seen. It should be simply check of transaction version number and similar to how wallets already ignore Coinbase input. This is necessary to prevent wallets from mistakenly spending, seeing a double spin. While it's supporting both uh, the regular, normal, everyday chain and the extension block funds must ignore existing outputs with the extension block. This is necessary to prevent wallets from mistakenly indexing the same output twice. The latter two points only apply to wallets which operate via direct uh, blockchain monitoring. Monitoring wallets typically watch the blockchain and index their own transaction and outputs. Uh, mean pool concerns, that's uh, the waiting area before a transaction gets through the process. Changes to the mean pool implementations are surprisingly minimal. Any details may differ across implementations. Um, confirming mean pools allow this allows cross-chain spins, so you can't send something through the um, extension block as well as the regular block and kind of get you know double spending going on, double your money, if you will. Then it gets into about data migration, mining concerns. Uh, I'm just going to kind of jump down here for motivation. All right, I'm just going to end here. So extension blocks is basically a kind of a two-tier system where you have regular blocks that are just going about their business and then you have extension blocks that allow for you to do transactions um, out that allow you to it's a little bit bigger 
It allows for more inputs, if you will, to propagate into the blockchain. And it's just like a special block that just kind of speeds along through the network, if you will, with more information in it. And uh, it allows for the network to continue to be what it is. Uh, you don't have to upgrade nodes or anything like that um, if you don't want to. Uh, wallets, for the most part, don't necessarily have to change too much unless they want to support both extension block uh, transactions and regular transactions and um, changes to the miner. So it allows for this option for people that need to get their uh, transactions out there to allow them to have, you know, a little bit of a fee, you know, nominal fees and things of that nature to go through extension blocks instead of basically paying for a higher fee cost for your transaction to go through, you can use extension blocks. So if you have like a $5 uh, transaction going through, you might use extension blocks as a means to getting your $5 transaction going through because on the regular blockchain, that $5 transaction is $5 a cent. And that's a bit ridiculous for me. So let's talk about a little bit about the drawbacks of this, of having these type of, um, in essence, kind of two block system going on in it and two different types of nodes, the ones that upgraded and the ones that did it. And this article by on NASDAQ kind of breaks it down very distinctly, very clearly, if you will. So, how Bitcoin extension blocks are backward compatible and how they're not. Uh, it's by Andrew Van, Van Wienern of Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, through a splash in the media, Person has in-house built an alternative Bitcoin implementation, Bitcoin. Recently presented their scaling proposal dubbed To the Moon, where Bitcoin XT, Bitcoin Classic, and Bitcoin Unlimited all attempted to increase the block size limit with a hard fork in Bitcoin Core. Developers prefer a seg segregated witness soft fork. Proof's uh, CEO Andrew Lee announced a third approach, extension block. Extension blocks were actually first proposed by Bitcoin Core developer Johnson Lee in 2013. So they're just kind of going over what you already know. So soft forks. Uh, we know what soft forks are. Extension blocks. So extension blocks resemble soft forks, but quite literally take the concept to another level. An extension block itself looks like a normal Bitcoin block, which we call a base block. Like a base block, an extension block mostly includes a bunch of transactions, but there is a difference. A base block is cryptography li cryptographically linked to the previous base block and to the next base block, chaining all the base blocks chronologically to form the Bitcoin's blockchain. An extension block, on the other hand, links only to the one corresponding base block. The extension blocks peg along base blocks. So instead of so what we normally know through consensus as the chain, where everything is added one after another, after another, after another, after another. They go through the entire process, uh, you know, from the mean pool, in, you know, into the block, being mined by the, the miners, being added to, put out, propagated out to the network, being added to the chain by the different nodes and verified as being, you know, the transaction history and everything is in chronological order. Think of like a count, one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can go back through time and everything's linked together. With extension blocks, say, for example, like a holiday. Uh, what is it? February 15th is President Day. Well, February 15th is always linked to President Day. You can't have every 15th of every month be President's Day. Uh, it's only occurring at that one moment in time in history. So it's only peg, it's pegged to that particular date and time. And that's very different from what's occurs where you can have basically President's Day every day, if you will, and keeps getting linked and added on and added on and added on and, and linked chronologically. That's not the case. It's just pegged to that very, uh, to that base block. And you can't really trace the full history, if you will, of the blockchain because what happens when a uh, transaction occurs on the first and you take that Bitcoin and you peg it to the 15th and then it's pegged to that moment and then whatever that 15th you know that present day of events have a, a ripple effect because it's, those coins are then being spent a different way somewhere down the road but you don't know it because it pegged those coins are pegged to the 15th so you don't know that the, the coins that were uh, used on the first and then put into the the day of the 15th you know the event like the say for example you bake the cake on the first and then you present it on President's Day, the 15th, um, and there's a little bit left over, if you will, and here it is, June 3rd, but you have no idea uh, at all that it, it's really, or not even just too far out, say, uh, the 18th. 
all you know is that you had that cake on the 15th and you're thinking it's fresh or good or whatever. But really, it was baked on the 1st and it's been sitting in the fridge for 15 days or whatever and it's bad. You're going to get sick. But you don't know that because the only thing you can do or see is that it's that you had it on President's Day. And that can be a very significant issue in um, transaction, um, doing transaction histories and finding and tracing stuff on the, on the public ledger, if you will. So similar to most soft forks, extension blocks utilize any one can spin address. But now these any one can spin address acts like enter, enter and exit points to and from the extension block. When a transaction is sent from the base block to an extension block, an old node is tricked. Uh, from the perspective of the old node, the coins are sent to a typical anyone can spin address on the base block. The coins never leave the base block as far as the old node is concerned, and in fact, the old node doesn't even know, even see the extension block. But from the perspective of a, no, a new node address, the bitcoins are really sent to a whole new address on the extension block, an extension address, and the extension address behaves more or less like a normal bitcoin address. Interestingly, these bitcoins can then even start to circulate from extension address to extension address from one extension block to the next. And as such, new nodes see the coins moving around and changing ownership. At the same time, the old nodes don't see anything and think the big coins are still stuck in the original anyone address. So, for example, uh, again, going back to the cake, that was baked, baked on the 1st, presented on the 15th, and then, you know, you put it in the refrigerator and you don't know um, come the 18th that is if, you know, now 18 year old, you know, 18 day cake. Well, if we go from holiday to holiday, for example, and saying using the same cake, and don't no shoot this cake, uh, you can go from, you know, February to Memorial Day to, you know, Labor Day, Fourth of July, packing this cake on and on and on. But anyone who looks at the history of it thinks that, oh, um, when I first saw this, it was all the way back to February 1st. Um, yeah, I might, I might not want to eat it, or I might not know about it, or maybe you just know only about, um, you know, President's Day, so you don't know that, you know, this cake has been passed around and around and around and around and around, and here you come. For example, say you can actually eat this cake. I don't know why I chose cake, maybe I should have chose something better, less perishable. Uh, Christmas Day, and you're sitting in this cake, um, you don't know how long it's been around in circulation. All you're, you're thinking about is, is, uh, the first, maybe, and it's all the way back then. You don't know all the different things that people may have added onto it, and they coughed on it, touched it, or whatever. It's a bad example. I have to think of a different analogy. But, um, basically they're tricking the old nose so they can, don't have to upgrade. Uh, so any new node can spin the bitcoins from the extension block to a normal dash in the base block. This is done by tricking old nodes again from the perspective. Okay, we already that. Once the bitcoins are back in the base block at a normal address, old and new nodes see the same thing. And perhaps the main benefit of extension blocks is they don't need to adhere to the original bitcoin protocol in almost any way. This opens up to a whole category of new possibilities. The extension blocks can perhaps offer more pro programmability like Ethereum or Ethereum Classic. Or more privacy like Monroe, Monroe, uh, Ccash or, uh, Ribble Wimble. And we'll talk about Ribble Wimble. Uh, Bitcoin's proposal is modest. However, to the moon, excision blocks are mostly just bigger than normal blocks. But as so far unknown amount, so they can handle more transactions. They also include segregated witness and some added beneficials specifically crafted to support the lightning network on top of the excision blocks. Complexity. While the extension block is general and to the, to the moon in particular can work technically, they do present some drawbacks. At the heart of these drawbacks, to the moon is more technically complex than any other scaling solutions proposed so far, including all the hard forks as well as segregated within soft forks. This also makes things more complicated to implement. And from a user perspective, to the moon will leave old nodes in the dark more than most soft forks do. While old nodes don't know how coins are coins on the soft fork, anyone can spend address to be spent. With extension blocks, all nodes don't even know where the coins are. So you're not able to track things around, and that can be a little tricky. This means that all nodes can't trace the history of a coin, perhaps in some cases temporarily can't even spin it. This can be the case of the blockchain reorganizes take place, and this can cosmetically change what a transaction from an extension block to an old node looks like. And as such, not everyone loves to the moon. Uh, Jocelyn Lee, the original proposal, Proposer of the extension blocks argues that the two to moon failed to meet the very important requirement of soft work backward compatibility. He said he still considers extension blocks as more of an academic topic than something really ready for production use. Similarly, 
Bitcoin Core developers and Bitcoin Knots maintainer Luke Dash Jr. warns that the exchange locks are at, at risk of creating two classes of full nodes. And Bitcoin Core developer Matt Corella dismisses the idea that exchange blocks should be considered an opt-in at all and said the entire network is forced to trust the exchange blocks is a pretty terrible precedent. So yeah, this, um, as an opt-in option, you, again, yeah, there, there's a trust factor going in and this is based on a trustless system. So that's a bit of an issue. Uh, here's an article about uh, BitPay is on board. They're utilizing the, uh, the test net test the whole extension block uh, theory. I have a link in the video. So here we go. Um, Whale Panda, a piece published on April 10th, the extended extension block story. We've all read how Andrew Lee presented the extension block story. It's a fun story, but there seems to be some crucial stuff that's been left out. Let's start how it was presented. Instead of using the normal channels of communication with proposals, mail and his top data bids, getting feedback, they immediately went to the press. This is not the way Bitcoin development works. This annoyed the dev community, but they're a young, new development team, so I'm sure they wanted some PR time and come up as savers to be. Okay, this is a big contentious problem. Um, we kind of touched on it several different times. If you have a decentralized system, you don't have channels you go through. You basically put the best code out for everyone to see, for them to test, check, and verify. And the fact that we have a centralized development team is is the biggest problem when it comes to discussion and scaling of the block size or any changes to Bitcoin in general. So one of the biggest other solutions that has been brought into the block size debate is the Lightning Network. Now the Lightning Network actually doesn't change the block size; it's an add-on. It's an additional layer to the protocol, and We'll break down what that means or adding layers um, to the protocol, if you will, when we talk about add-ons, when we talk about uh, things that can be added to the protocol that doesn't change the protocol but allows for Bitcoin to navigate um, better um, as a cryptocurrency. Um, there's other cryptocurrencies that are seeking to do that. Lightning Coin uh, is looking to implement Lightning Network onto its protocol, but uh, in and of itself, it's not a change of the block size, if you will. It's a, it's a protocol change. It's an, another mechanism for people to make payments and to um, tra do transactions. So I'm just going to give a kind of a rough definition of Lightning Network. So here we go. Uh, Lightning Network is a pro proposed implementation of Hash time-like contracts with bi-directional payment channels, which allows payments to be securely routed across multiple peer-to-peer -peer payment channels. This allows the formation of a network where any peer on the network can pay any other peer, even if they don't directly have a channel open between each other. So, let's do some definitions here. This is from the uh, Bitcoin Wicca. Uh, here in the glossary, so bi-directional payment channels, what does that mean? A payment channel where payments can flow both directions, from Alice to Bob and back to Alice. This is in contrast with uh, the Spillman style and the SLTV style payment channels, where payments can only go one direction. And once Alice has paid Bob, all the big questions deposit in the channel funding transaction. The channel is no longer useful, and so it will be closed. So basically, it's just an open channel to where if you are constantly transacting uh, with an individual, say, for example, paying your water bill you would have that channel open. So that water, you know, you label it water channel and allows you to send those transactions at any time on that channel to do the payments for water. Just kind of like, um, more like Amazon or uh, your grocery store might have your stored credit card information to where you do the one click type of a deal and you don't have to always constantly input your information. That's the same kind of mechanism or idea, if you will, but implemented in uh, into uh, the, the cryptocurrency ecosystem. So key features. Um, rapid payments. Payments with an established channel can be made almost as fast as the data traveling over the internet between the two peers. No third party trust. The two, peer, two peers in the channel pay each other directly using regular Bitcoin transactions or which only is broadcast. So at no point does any third party control their funds. 
Uh, so you don't have to use a mechanism like a, a BitPay or Coinbase to be, you know, with merchants and in in, in individuals. You don't have to go through them. Uh, reduce blockchain load. Only channel open transactions. Channels close transactions. Hopefully, infrequent anti-fraud re respends need to be committed to the blockchain, allowing all other payments within the Lightning Network channels to remain uncommitted. This allows the night Lightning Network users to make frequent payments secured by Bitcoin without placing excessive load on full nodes which must be processed each transaction on the blockchain. So you can send these payment channels and it can go to that payment channel. So for example, if you're paying your water bill and every month it's like 75 bucks, 75 bucks, 75 bucks. Well, the water company might not um, close that channel or uh, remove that Bitcoin until when it's necessary. So they might do it like every quarter. And so instead of having 75, 75, 75 enter into the, um, to the blockchain you have it bundled together basically and you have a, a total of 225 going once within the um, block channel instead of each individual transaction if you will uh, channels can stay open indefinitely as long as the two parties in the channel continue to cooperate with each other the channel can stay open indefinitely there's no mandatory timeout period they can further reduce the load on the blockchain as well allow fees for opening and closing the channel to be um, Amortize over a long period of time. Rapid cooperative close. If both proper property, if both par, prop, uh, both parties cooperate, a channel can be closed immediately. With the parties likely wanting to wait for one or more confirmation to ensure the channel closed in the correct state. Non-cooperative closes such as when one party disappears are also possible, but they take longer. Uh, outsourceable enforcement. If one party closes a channel in the old state and attempts to steal money, the other party has to act within a definite period of time to block the attempted theft. This function can be outsourced to a third party without giving them control over any funds, allowing wallets to safely go offline for periods longer than a defined period. Onion style routing. Uh, payment routing information can be encrypted in a nested fashion so the intermediary nodes can only know who they received a routable payment from and who, it, and who to send it to the next, preventing those intermediary nodes from knowing who the originator or destination is, providing that intermediaries don't compare, compare records. Uh, Multi-SIG cap capability, each party can require that their payments in the channel be signed multiple keys, giving them access to additional security techniques. A securely cross blockchains, payments can be routed across more than one blockchain, including all coins and side chains. As long as all those chains support the same hash function to use for the hash lock, as well as the ability to create time locks. Uh, sub Satoshi payments, payments can be made conditional upon the outcome of a random event, allowing problems, probabilistic payments. For example, Alice can pay Bob. 0.1 Satoshi by creating a 1 Satoshi payment 10 to 1 odds so that 90% of the time uh, she does this, she pays them 0 Satoshis and 10% of the time she pays them 1 Satoshi for an average payment of 0.1 Satoshi. Uh, single funded channels, when Alice needs to send a payment to Bob and doesn't currently have a way to pay him through the Lightning Network, whether she can't reach him or because she doesn't have enough money in the existing channel, she can make a regular on-chain payment that establishes the channel without Bob needing to add any of his funds to the channel. Also, um, um, Alice only uses 12 bits more than she would for a non-lightning direct payment, and Bob can only need need about 25 more SegWit virtual bytes to close the channel than he would have if he received a non-lightning direct payment. So it, it just allows for uh, kind of different scenarios of payments. So a, what a channel is, is a communication channel that allows two parties to make more secure payments between each other in exchange for making only a few transactions on the blockchain. Comment transaction. Transactions create collaboratively between Alice and Bob each time they update their state of the channel. It records their current balance within the channel. The initial commitment transaction is the first of these transactions is a record of the initial balance within the channel. This is the second of the maximum of three on-chain transactions needed to maintain a lightning channel. It can be combined with a funding transaction for a new channel on the cooperative conditions necessary to create an excessive settlement transactions. Um, CSV. It is an opcode that allows an output to conditionally specify how long it must be part of the blockchain before an input spending may be added to the blockchain. So this is a, just a, a, a payment method, if you will, for allowing for transactions to occur that doesn't allow for um, constant inputs onto the blockchain. And this is an add-on that people want so that they can do multiple different types of transactions. They don't have to rely on a 10-minute confirmation. Uh, they don't have to do, if they're doing a consistent uh, history with somebody, they don't have to constantly input into the blockchain. And it's a way of still having the security of the 
uh, blockchain network, but being able to do everyday regular transactions without absorbing amount of fees or clogging up the network, if you will. So that is the Lightning Network, and you can't really get Lightning Network until you kind of resolve the block size debate. Um, a lot of times it's, it's tagged into SegWit as a mechanism. To if Once you have SegWit, then you can do Lightning Network, because um, when we get into SegWit, there's a unique properties within SegWit that allows for uh, Lightning no Network to function um, better or properly, if you will. But Lightning Network in itself doesn't change the block size at all is an added layer to the to the blockchain is another mechanism to do functions with cryptocurrency that doesn't alter significantly the consensus or the Bitcoin protocol or has anything to do with um, breaking the network or changing the network radically if you will and we'll get into the in depth on you know the lightning network mechanics when we talk about these add-ons but just so you know it's it's not a change in the block size at all, Lightning Network. Uh, Mimblewimble, uh, you might be familiar with that phrase. It comes from Harry Potter. And it was a proposal that was done um, last year that has now garnered some um, traction this year. And we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, what is Mimblewimble? This is from Crypto Compare. Uh, the transparent nature of Bitcoin is what allows it to be decentralized currency. Uh, there's a public ledger, and we can all agree on the transactions that have occurred in the Bitcoin network to look at it. Okay, so skipping here. Okay, the lack of privacy can scare off regular users as comp companies that don't want their finances to be available to the competition. Fundamentally, issues arise when a specific coin can be singled out due to its past history and refuses payment because of it. Uh, we've had that issue with... Um, when we talk about the Silk Road Marketplace, uh, Coinbase, um, that exchange is notorious for shutting down um, Bitcoin accounts because of that. There was a recent article um, discussing the fact that a white hacker had his account shut down because his clients asked him to secure uh, Bitcoin for them and then pay out for the ransomware. And his Coinbase was uh, shut down. And we'll talk about ransomware and that whole mess in itself at some point in time. But... Because of the transparent nature and the tracking that can occur on the Bitcoin blockchain, this scares people away from, from the usage of Bitcoin. Despite the tools that are available, such as Bitcoin mixers, P2P exchanges, and the ability to use Bitcoin through Tor, there's not, these are not perfect. Other cryptocurrencies have enjoyed multiple methods that seek to solve this issue, including the implementation of masternodes, ring signatures, and most recently, uh, ZK Snarks. However, these require the use of... Users should convert his Bitcoins into an alternative cryptocurrency that's always more volatile, and that can also be an issue. However, there are multiple projects that are being worked on in order to bring a higher degree of privacy to Bitcoin, and one of these is called Mimblewimble, a proposal for a Bitcoin-like blockchain that could be implemented as a sidechain or potentially in the far future as an extension block scheme that would be like an integrated sidechain. Uh, Mimblewimble leverages previous concepts like confidential transaction and one-way aggregated signatures. To provide private transactions a better scalability, which, which contrasts with the previous proposals where a trade off between privacy and scalability take place. However, this proposal also removes some of Bitcoin's functionalities. And let's take a look. So, one of the major differences between Bitcoin and Mimblewimble is that Mimblewimble supports confidential transactions. In a Bitcoin transaction, everything is public. We can see the input and output of values and we can verify the transactions as being valued. If these are added up, the sum of the inputs and the sum of the outputs. So you can see everything on the Bitcoin blockchain. In the confidential transaction system, all the values are homographically encrypted with random strings and numbers called blinding factors. This means that the values cannot be seen directly and they're rather encrypted in a manner that allows the math to be done with ciphertext and generated an encrypted result that when decrypted match the results of the operation performed in plain text. That means that the values are encrypted, but it's possible to calculate that, the, that all the outputs minus all the input values add up to zero and verify the transaction is valued. Here, transactions also include information with which receive can decrypt amounts. As confidential transactions, both the sender and receiver know the binding factor. In Mimblewimble, the receiver of transaction generates the blind factor, which is used to prove, to prove ownership of the bitcoins, and that way, it does, the way it does it through the excessive value, which is which is the difference between inputs and outputs. This excessive value is a set of random numbers and ensure only the person who generated the blending factor, the receiver, can spend the Bitcoin. So the blending factors do not add up to zero anymore, but rather to another amount that is likely a private key. 
Uh, this way to think about this is the excessive and multi standard key. Basically, it's a multi standard key with the owner of all the inputs and the owners of all the outputs. Um, Limbo 1 also gets rid of the individual transactions by advancing on a previous concept of coin join by making it non interactive. Instead of containing transactions, Limbo 1 blocks will only have a list of new inputs, a list of new outputs, and a list of signatures which are created from the aforementioned excess values. Since the values are homo graphically encrypted, nodes can verify that no bitcoins are being created or destroyed. The excess value signatures will turn prove that all the transactions are valid since they only add up if the whole transaction does. In this scheme, neither the values or the destination of the transactions are known since the inputs and outputs are all contained in the blocks and not separated. Each output can be designated for every, for every other input with no way of associating one to the other. One of the most exciting things about Mimble Wimble is it's a scalable solution. If there's, if there's a if it were to activate on the Bitcoin since day one, the blockchain would be somewhat bigger, a few gigabytes that is now than it is now. However, when compared to other solutions like confidential transactions, it's a very positive result since CT activated since day one could have added up to a terabyte of blockchain data. However, Mimble Wimble also has a disadvantage to remove Bitcoin's functionality by removing scripts. However, developers are researching ways of allowing Bitcoin to retain its Functionality in the Mimble Wimble scheme. And nonetheless, if it is to be implemented, it's most likely will be a sidechain or a separate altcoin. Um, currently, right now, it's being uh, developed into an altcoin called, um, I think it's Grin. Um, and we'll talk about sidechains in a second. But, you know, you might hear when Mimble Wimble as, you know, just one of those things that people throw out to, to kind of negate the fact that, you know, nothing's being done by Bitcoin Core, that all these different altcoins are coming into existence. They have all these different features that people have been proposed, proposed like from the very beginning of Bitcoin or per, fairly early on, and they have not been added in, like, you know, addressing the privacy issues, addressing the transaction fees, malleability, uh, uh, fungibility, things of that nature that currently right now the Bitcoin Core developers haven't addressed. And right now we're at the status quo, almost kind of stagnation when it comes to you know, raising the block size and debate. I want to say stagnation, but we're at a very significant hard impasse, if you will. Okay, and a simple explanation of a Bitcoin side chains. This comes from Richard Gindle Brown, Thoughts on the Future of Finance. A simple explanation of Bitcoin side chains. Could side, chain, side chains be an enabler of a semi decentralized Bitcoin products and services? Uh, a paper was published uh, this week, Enabling Bitcoin Innovation with Peg Sidechains, by Adam Back, Matt uh, Corolla, Luke J Jash Jr., Mark Freeberg, Gregory Maxwell, so basically the core devs here. If you follow Bitcoin for any time, you know this is a serious intimate group of authors. This came out um, October of 2014. It describes a way to build peg sidechains. Side chains themselves are not new. The idea and how to build them has been discussed for some time, and the key breakthrough was outlined earlier this year. But this paper gives more detail on the concept and has attached a lot of comments. But what are they, and what should anyone care? A mental, mental model for Bitcoin. So the key to understanding most innovations in the Bitcoin space is to make sure you have the right mental model for how Bitcoin itself works. It turns out that most people I speak don't really understand how it works. And the result has a faulty mental model. To help with this, I came up with an analogy of Bitcoin earlier this year based on thinking of Bitcoin as unspent transaction outputs as parcels of land. Some people hate the analogy, but I still think it has value. But in this piece, I'll skip the analogy and net it down to the basics. First, clear your head of anything related to money, currency, or payment. And clear your head of the word ledger. Two, the mind-bending secret of Bitcoin is it actually isn't a ledger. The only data structures that matter are the transaction and block of transaction. And it's important to get this clear in your head if sidechains are going to make sense. When you move Bitcoins, what you're saying is, hello everybody, I'd like to move these specific Bitcoins, please. Here's the proof that I, I am entitled to move them, and here's how the recipient will in turn prove that they are entitled to move them. So, step one, identify them as an unspent Bitcoin outputs I want to move. Reference as previous transactions and unspent transaction outputs. Two, prove I own them. Prove the public key and prove your process the correct private key, sign something. Three, set the challenge for the new the next owner. Uh, specify the secret or recipient uh, must prove that they know in order to spend the funds. Uh, the crucial three parts of Bitcoin transactions are several important points here. One, Bitcoins are not perfectly fungible. When you move or spend them, you're spending some specific Bitcoins. Two, in order to spend them, you have to prove you're entitled to do so. And you do that by proving the solution to a challenge that was laid down when you were, they were sent to you in the first place. 
This channel is usually just proves to the world that you know the public key that corresponds to a particular Bitcoin address and all its possessions that correspond to the private key, but it can be more sophisticated than that. Uh, when you send Bitcoin somewhere, you lay down the challenge for the next owner. Usually, you simply specify the need to know the public and private key pair that corresponds to the Bitcoin address the coins were sent to. But it can be more complicated than that. In general cases, you don't even know who the next owner is. It's just whoever can satisfy the condition. Keep saying the three steps to yourself until they're etched in your memory. Fine, so the, so the grammar of Bitcoin transactions is clear. Here are the coins I want to move. Here's the proof I'm entitled to. And here's what the recipient must do in turn if they want to spend them. This transaction is published onto the network and eventually finds its way into the block. And after other blocks have been built on top, everyone can pretty sure it can be reversed and the world moves on. What more do you need? Uh, the big, the core Bitcoin grammar works just fine, mostly. This three-part structure of Bitcoin transactions work well, and it turns out that you can do some really interesting things with it. For example, you can use a not entirely fungible feature to tag coins that is the basis of the color coins and smart property worlds. Again, those these are add-ons and side stuff that we'll we'll talk about eventually. But there are problems with such block intervals. Bitcoin's block interval is ten minutes, so it takes about it's not ten minutes any longer. Ten minutes on average for a new transaction to find its way into the block, even if it, if it pays a high fee. This is too slow for some people, so they can have experimented with alternate currencies based on the Bitcoin code base, which employs quicker block intervals. Uh, transaction structure. The three-part transaction structure is very general, but it only allows you to transfer ownership of Bitcoin. Some people will like to transmit richer forms of information across the sort of systems. For example, a decentralized exchange needs a way to persist its place orders, projects such as MasterCoin, Counterparty, NXT, and others. Either build layers on top of Bitcoin or use uh, entirely different code bases to achieve these goals. Uh, transaction transfer conditions. I said the above that you can build sophisticated rules into the Bitcoin transaction that specify how ownership is proved. However, Bitcoin scripting language is really, really limited and many ideas like uh, the smart contract space are difficult or impossible to implement. That's why we have Ethereum. So such projects as Ethereum build an entirely new infrastructure to for these ideas. Uh, one size fits all security model. It doesn't matter if you're moving one billion or zero or one cent across the Bitcoin network, you get the same security guarantee. And if you pay this in the fees and time, what if you're prepared to trade safety for speed? Today, your only real option is to send the coins to a centralized wallet provider whom you must trust not to lose or steal your coins. You can then do all the transactions you like on their books with their own customers and you not touch the Bitcoin blockchain. But now you lose all the benefits of a decentralized value transfer network. So things like uh, BitPay and Coinbase uh, utilize this type of method. One size fits all doesn't help if the size doesn't fit you. Now, making an experimental or rapid changes to Bitcoin is very risky, and so changes happen slowly. So, if one size fits all architecture of Bitcoin doesn't suit your particular use case, you have a problem. You either have to use an entirely different cryptocurrency or build one, or you have to use or build a centralized service which brings new risks. This is very inconvenient and creates risk and fragmentation and slow build out of products, services, and infrastructure. Uh, centralized wallet providers are a poor man's sidechain. So there's an interesting observation we can make. Think about what happens if you send Bitcoin to a centralized wallet, such as Circle.com. Uh, they don't do Bitcoin any longer, but we say Coinbase for safekeeping. Uh, you spend your coin, you send your coins to, your, to the particular Bitcoin address. They appear inside your Circle wallet or your Coinbase wallet, and you're out of your control on the blockchain. At some point in the future, you might send your your coins back out of your uh, Coinbase wallet to a Bitcoin address you know. Now you have to control the same coins on the Bitcoin blockchain again. From the perspective of the Bitcoin network, Circle is a black box. You had some coins, you sent them to a specific address, some stuff happened that the Bitcoin couldn't see, and at some point later you can, you had control of some coins again. It's after those coins have been moved from Bitcoin to somewhere else and then back again. Here's the sidechain insight. The idea, the key idea behind the sidechain side concept is, what if you could send Bitcoins not only to individuals, addresses, and centralized services, but to other blockchains? Imagine there is a block Bitcoin-like system out there you like to use, perhaps in Litecoin or Ethereum, or perhaps in something brand new. Maybe it has a faster block confirmation interval and richer scripting language. It doesn't matter. The point is you like to use it, but you rather not have to go through the risk of effort of buying the native tokens for the platform. If you have Bitcoin already, why can't you use them? Sidechain ideas is this. Send your Bitcoin to a specifically formed Bitcoin address. The address is specifically designed so the coins will now be out of your control and out of the control of anybody else either. They're completely immobilized and can only be unlocked if somebody can prove they're no longer being used as they were. I'll explain what I mean in, this in a minute. In other words, you have used the core Bitcoin transaction rules I described by above to lay down a specific, specific condition that the future owner, whoever it is, it, it, 
and whoever ends up being needs to fulfill the order to take control. Once the immobilization transaction is sufficiently confirmed, you can send a message to other blockchain, the ones you wanted to use. This message contains a proof that the coins were sent to the specific to a special address on the Bitcoin network, that they are therefore now immobilized and crucially that you were the ones who did it. If the second blockchain has agreed to do a to be a block Bitcoin sidechain, it now does something really special. It creates the exact same number of tokens on its own network and gives you control of them. So as if your Bitcoins have been transferred to the second chain, and remember, they're immobilized on the Bitcoin network, so we haven't created or destroyed any, just move them. You can now transact with those coins in the second chain uh, under whatever rules the chain chooses to implement. Perhaps blocks are created faster on the side chain. Perhaps transaction scripts are, tr are turning complete. Perhaps you have to pay fees to uh, incent those securing the side chain. Who knows? The rules can to be whatever those running the sidechain wanted to be. The only rule that matters is that the sidechain agrees to follow the convention that if you can prove you put some Bitcoins out of reach on Bitcoin network, the same number will pop up in the existing sidechain. And now for the second clever part. The logic above is symmetric. So at any point, whoever is holding these coins in the sidechain can send them back to the Bitcoin network by creating a special transaction on the sidechain that immobilizes the Bitcoin on the sidechain. They'll disappear from the sidechain and become available again on the Bitcoin network under the control of whoever last owned them on the sidechain. So step one, identity that is, that is yet unspent Bitcoin outputs I want to move. Two, prove I own them. Three, unlock them until somebody proves that they're no longer being used on the sidechain. Uh, sidechain use standard Bitcoin three-step transaction to mobilize Bitcoin whistle there on the sidechain. So I'll repeat, if you use standard Bitcoin transaction functionality, move coins out of reach, and then you then prove to a second unrelated chain that we've done this, and when we're done, Whoever owns them on the sidechain can do the same thing and send them back to the Bitcoin network. So developers get the opportunity to experiment with different types of cryptocurrency worlds without needing to create their own currency. So imagine if you went and spent and bought an Xbox, right? And you bought it through a purse on Amazon. And you, you wanted to use Litecoin because it's a faster transaction and they started accepting Litecoin. So you would immobilize those Bitcoin, uh, utilize the Litecoin to purchase your item, and then you you know you spent it it's done it's transaction and what can happen is because those special litecoins or litecoin tokens that can be pegged back to bitcoin a uh, purse maybe at the end of the month or two months from now you can take those litecoins send them back to the bitcoin network and collect those bitcoins now because now it's become possible to do something very interesting things in the bitcoin space so step back from the details for a moment and consider that what's been described. We now have a way to move coins from Bitcoin onto another platform, a sidechain, and move them back again. That's pretty much what we do when we move them to a wallet platform or exchange. The difference is that the platform they've been moved to is also a blockchain. So it has a possibility of decentralized security, visibility, and a gain from other inventions in the space. For example, one can imagine a sidechain that's mined only by one company that would be identical to a single company wallet, but with full visibility of transactions. Going further, you can imagine a side chain that's mined by 100 different companies in a loose federation, not totally decentralized, but parties and sensors subvert them if you were just one. And then there's lots of other possibilities. The key is that you can build these experiments and products and services without needing to create a new currency or fall back to the old centralized style. So when I look at side chains, I look at them as an architect for building semi-decentralized products and services for Bitcoin, that were simply impossible before. Now there are some serious issues with the scheme. Peter Todd has raised doubts about how secure it might be, and it might require a one-off change to Bitcoin. But in the early days, I'm looking forward to watching the space develop. So this is a possible solution that people have discussed and talked about when it comes to, you know, as a, an add-on and a change to the Bitcoin space. But in of itself, it doesn't change fundamentally um, the box size. Now there are, might be a solution to where a proposal where you can implement sidechain better if you were to raise the block size, you know, either SegWit or uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, XT or Classic or anything like that. But in of itself, sidechains in themselves are not, um, they're not expanding the block size in themselves. They're an add-on. They're a feature that can be added to the protocol um, if it's permitted or allowed. And finally, what is parity Bitcoin? This comes from JP Bunix at the Merkle. What is parity Bitcoin? Uh, there's some there are some quite intriguing developments to be found in the world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. Parity Technology has released their Bitcoin technology stack, stacks which also feature a new implementation of the Bitcoin protocol. This client is focusing on performance and reliability. Now is a good time to take a closer look at what the Parity Bitcoin client is all about. So much similar to Bitcoin, um, this is another kind of implementation of the Bitcoin client for people to 
do function and do things within the Bitcoin protocol as it currently is. A parity Bitcoin client is an intriguing project. It's not surprising to find out that a lot of people have no idea what the big deal is regarding this project. Parity Technology is a business venture com- compromised of a large number of developers who created Ethereum and its commercial implementation. The team has also taken a keen interest to, to, pr- to bring improvements to the Bitcoin protocol as it suffers from issues regarding performance and reliability in their opinion. What the Parity Bitcoin client does is address these problems and do so in an open manner. The source code of the project can be found on GitHub, which allows anyone in the world to build on top of the existing code base moving forward. The entire project has been built from scratch, which is a strong focus on proper software development. Moreover, it's fully comp- compliant with the legacy Bitcoin implementation. It's also worth mentioning that the project is written in Rust, a coding language which is both fast and secure at the same time. So we have another coding, different coding implementation. Instead of CPC+, which is what currently the Bitcoin Core protocol is done, uh, Bitcoin, which is stop, JavaScript, we have Rust. In fact, the Zcash team has been using Rust as well in recent months. The new coding language offers speed improvements at any code and seems capable of allowing developers to introduce a lot of new features in the future. Moreover, quite a few parties have been supported the development of the Parity Bitcoin client. Uh, F2 Pool, Bitmain, and BitNex are some of the initial sponsors of the venture. Parity Technologies is a VC funded enterprise, and the Parity Ethereum client has received a lot of praise since the release. Moreover, the Ethereum client can be integrated directly into a browser, and the same now applies to the Bitcoin counterpart. While the Parity Bitcoin client is mainly designed as a new go to solution for developers, it's also a good addition to the list of alternative protocol implications. We have highlighted several of those implications in the past, including Bitcoin, uh, BTCP, and others. A growing diversity of Bitcoin protocol implications can only be seen as a positive development. Moreover, the Parity Bitcoin client brings us to one step closer to accessible integration of the Shorniger signatures of Bitcoin users. As we talked about earlier, Shorniger signatures provide additional features to Bitcoin users all over the world, and Parity Bitcoin can serve as a test. Uh, that ecosystem tests the viability of such an implementation before it becomes part of the main Bitcoin protocol. So if you hear what uh, if you hear that word parity Bitcoin, I've heard it in a few conversations, but all it is is just again, it's just basically a different protocol implementation for people to develop and build off of Bitcoin. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, this is a decentralized system, it's an open platform. People are able to take and implement as long as they're um, adhering to the you know the core consensus if you will of the Bitcoin protocol. So they can do it in JavaScript, they can do it in Rust. Um how they can do it in Morse code if they can figure out how to do it, something like that. Um as long as it adheres to, you know, whatever the consensus of the community is at the time for the implementation of the, the development of this, you know, library of systems and um, manipulation. So we discuss what extension blocks are, which is a proposal and solution to the block size debate. Um, the de- we define what Lightning Network and Limbo, Limbo is. Uh, again, Lightning Network is a pretty much a consistent consensus uh, solution. Like a lot of people are for actual Lightning Network as an add-on eventually onto the to the Bitcoin protocol. And then we have you know Limbo, Limbo, which is a one of those unique kind of weird out there proposals to changing. Um, Bitcoin, and again, we'll go in depth about uh, Lightning Network and uh, Limbo Limbo, and then we discuss parity. And here, this is not ac- exactly a uh, proposal in itself. It's just more of a a term that uh, we need to discuss, and it has to do with uh, Bitcoin and Lightning. And just simply, um, again, it's just a confusion of terms when people uh, discuss uh, the block size can, uh, debate where you get these terms thrown out here and people think that emerging consensus is actually a proposal when it's not is a, a mechanism that's part of other proposals so uh, that's why we're discussing it emerging consensus why bitcoin emerging consensus uh, is a gamble uh, by Aaron van weirden from bitcoin magazine so bitcoin unlimited one of the bitcoin core softworks introduced in late 2015 garnered much attention in recent months. The project gained hashing power support from several new Bitcoin pools, including uh, via BTC, GP Miner, and BTC uh, dot top, while node adoption appears to be on the rise as well. The central idea behind Bitcoin Unlimited is specific in Bitcoin Unlimited Improvement Proposal 001. So yeah, so they have their own particular GitHub. They're not, or BIP, I should say, they're not part of the Bitcoin core uh, BIP. 
is to hand control of the Bitcoin block size to users and miners, or perhaps more accurately, to take this control more explicitly and easier to handle. But as explained in how Bitcoin Unlimited users may end up on different blockchains, BU, uh, that's a different article link here, uh, BIP00, zero zero, or BUP, BIP, BUP, I'm gonna call it BURP, BURP001 zero zero does not include technical consensus mechanisms as reliable as Bitcoin's current consensus rules. Instead, Bitcoin Unlimited relies on the philosophy often referred to as emerging consensus. Uh, note, if you're not sure how Bitcoin Unlimited works or what the technical weaknesses of BURP001 are, make sure you read this first. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. But I just wanted to define the term of emerging consensus. So BURP001 uh, does not ensure machine consensus. Users can configure their nodes to split into different blockchains, either intentionally or unintentionally. Instead, Bitcoin Unlimited relies on emerging consensus. So a machine consensus is you have to do the proof of work. You have to do the work. That's why we talked about uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's consensus in solving the uh, Byzantine generals problem. You have to do the mathematical computations. That's what machine consensus is. You have to put in the work. Uh, this convention, this convention, the participants in the Bitcoin ecosystems have a strong enough economic incentive to converge on a single blockchain, such that they will converge on a single blockchain. If their software does not automatically realize this, users can expect to configure their settings to make it happen. After all, it benefits everyone to be on the same blockchain to be able to transact with, with one another. However, this emerging consensus should should form is not really documented in Howard. While some have made analogies with flocks of birds, for example, it's not clear how these apply to Bitcoin exactly. That said, it's possible to draw out a scenario that many Bitcoin unlimited proponents roughly envision. At first step, users should signal what size of block they will accept with the excessive block size EV setting. The miners incentivized to satisfy market demand should increase or decrease. The block size limit accordingly. So basically, node operators will state that they will accept a bigger block size. Uh, this will let miners know that there, there's a marketplace or that there's um, a network um, indication out there that if they were to mine a bigger block size or any one of these upgrade protocols, that that people would um, go for it, if you will, or accept it. There's not going to be split in the network. Finally, if there's a new block exceeding some users' EP, these users are expected to follow regardless, either because their accepted acceptance depth setting is triggered, or maybe because they reconfigured the nodes manually. As explained um, in how Bitcoin Unlimited users may end up on different blockchains, this scenario does present some problems. For one, if users' EB signal is truly spoofed by an adversary miner, it can be picked up in thinking a block size limit increase has more support than it does, or perhaps malicious miners can themselves trick users. And for the remaining users, the scenario presents an odd choice. Either they set their AD settings low to remain in consensus by essentially giving up much of the anonymity to miners or the or autonomy to miners, or they set the ID settings high to protect their autonomy for risk splitting the network. And then off chain coordination. To counter some problems described, emerging consensus can also be established through debate on forums, blog posts, chat rooms, and other media. Realistically, it may require this kind of off chain coordination to some extent. For example, while mining pool via BTCs wants to hard fork to a two megabyte block size limit, that is not what a pool is currently simulating with its EB settings. If it did, that would be abused. It could be abused to split the network instead. Network instead, VB signal support from one megabyte in their miner guide proposed to hard fork two megabytes once at least seventy five percent of the hashing power and knowledge support. However, this kind of off chain coordination is not unique. Groups of people have coordinated and achieved consensus through discourse for a long time, but such systems often either have a leader or tend to break down and split into fractions once the number of participants reach a certain size. Other popular open source projects, for example, sometimes consist of hundreds of incompatible forks. And this is probably even more true under adversarial conditions. If the people in the group don't really know, know or trust one another, they have no way of knowing whether the other people are telling the truth or lying. Even a single av adversary can pretend to be many users and communicate many false pretenses. This makes coordinating re and reaching consensus a very difficult problem to solve. In fact, this is the Byzantine General's problem. This is exactly what Satoshi Nakamoto attempted to address. With a, ta attack, uh, with a track record of about eight years, Bitcoin's main technology, technological achievement is a math-based protocol that realizes strong, fast, scalable, and automated machine consensus for large groups of people who do not necessarily know or trust one another, but Bitcoin is reasonably visit default tolerant. Bitcoin unlimited proponents believe that Bitcoin's economic incentives, the incentive for users to all remain part of the same Bitcoin blockchain, is in itself sufficiently visit default tolerant. 
But this so far is largely unproven. No alkaline relies on similar assumptions, nor is there any even a test net where the uh, uh, BURP 001 configuration are actively used. What Bitcoin Unlimited changes? That said, part of the same Bitcoin Unlimited philosophy is that Bitcoin relies on sort of emergent consensus anyways. Rather than really rely on math, code, or protocol, protocol may, many really see Bitcoin as consensus between people's first and foremost. People choose to partake in the system. People give it value. And sometimes, like during the August 2010 and March 2013 blockchain forks, people have to coordinate off-chain to determine which chain is valued. As such, uh, Burp 01 doesn't fundamentally change anything. Users choose to run Bitcoin Unlimited node software can already be recoupled, and social consensus may have to form off-chain either way. But by making this control more explicit and easier to handle, and some users actually use these options, Bitcoin Unlimited does rely on the human consensus aspect to a much larger extent. Rather than opting into a protocol once and rely on machine consensus from then on, users need to take on a much more proactive role. As one Bitcoin Unlimited proponent noted, shortly after miners had to reconfigure the nodes in response to a bug that briefly forked the network earlier this week, this is part of, part of how Bitcoin works. It's not meant for people just sleeping at the wheel. It's true that uh, BURP001 doesn't introduce anything that wasn't possible before. As an open source project, users and miners can always recompile their Bitcoin software to do anything that Bitcoin Unlimited allow allows. But of course, this in itself is not an argument in favor of BURP001. Uh, Just because users could, that does not mean they should. So far, the Bitcoin has several forks that lasted for several blocks caused by technical flare failures. The August 10, 2010 blockchain fork was needed to revert the creation of billions of Bitcoins out of thin air, which required an orphan in an hour-long chain. The only reason that event wasn't catastroph catastrophic is that Bitcoin was hardly used as money back then. During the March 2013 blockchain fork, however, the network was unreliable for real users, and at least one person was double-spent, while several miners wasted valuable resources mining an orphan chain. The same is true for the July 2015 blockchain fork, which miners were urged to switch to fully validated mining pools and many have learned from that mistake. Indeed, developers, miners, and the rest of the Bitcoin community have generally tried to avoid these type of crisis events as much as possible as they possibly can. In contrast, Bitcoin Unlimited seems to embrace them as an upgrade mechanism. Basically, emerging consensus is more of a social consensus, if you will, instead of an actual mathematical protocol, where you have to go through a process of complicating, you know, computation of a certain problem to solve and everyone has to agree these set of rules or these these set of transactions aren't going to occur and that could in in essence um, be a problem or a strengthening an asset but just so you know emergent consensus itself is not an actual uh, proposal or um, a change in the block size is a a mechanism as part of the Bitcoin Unlimited proposal that allows for changes of consensus. It's changing consensus in general from the Satoshi Nakamoto consensus into which some people consider not to be a very um, strong network consensus because it's not backed by any kind of mathematical protocol. It's about people's beliefs and feelings and actions, uh, individual actions, the human quotient, quotient, a component of the human component than the actual a mathematical component, if you will, or a network, or putting your putting more of your hardware, the, you know, your the skin in the game aspect, if you will. So that's it for this episode. Uh, I thank you very much for listening. Um, our next episode, we will be dealing with actually addressing the issue of SegWit and the user activated software. That will be followed by um, the actual proposal that came out of New York. And then we'll have like a little little mini episode about how people are feeling about that proposal, um, the different companies that have come out against um, one version or the other version of SegWit. And then we'll talk about uh, Bitcoin Unlimited. And then we'll discuss um, nodes and hardware and decentralization. Basically all the, the negativity of all the different uh, proposals, like the downsides of these. You know, which one's most likely going to cause the uh, block split, if you will. And then we'll discuss what the block split, split is. Like, is it a doomsday scenario? Or is it going to be like uh, what did happen with Ethereum, where you have um, Ethereum and then ETC Classic. And so you have a split in the chain and two, diff two different networks um, going on, on, with one being a uh, higher value than the other, other one. 
where some people can consider it stronger, where you have ETC, you know, still hanging in there, still doing things, still have writing utility, but uh, slowly but surely gaining some bit of a momentum. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, the way of Bitcoin, about whether Bitcoin is stored value, if it's, you know, digital cash, the way people perceive or think of Bitcoin. And then basically, we'll wrap things up, uh, you know, um, you know, Bitcoin is a messy bit of all uh, the discussions we have about the block size debate. Hopefully, that I don't think I'll have a need to add anything additional, but that's pretty much it. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Hello Trisha Space Odyssey Network production.